Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the City of Sebastian Planning and Zoning Commission and Local Planning Agency meeting Thursday, June 20, 2019, to order. Can you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> I'd like to first make some announcements. Chairman Kothenberg is excused, and Mr. Eugen is also excused from tonight's meeting. Mr. Simmons and Mr. Monty will be voting in their place. And Mr. Reyes, for the record, uh, Jan is going to do roll call. Thank you. I should have done that first, Anne. And is your, Mrs. Your Grant, will you please do roll call? Yes. Are your microphones on? Both on. That's okay. new to me, but I have them both on. I think they can hear me anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Roth. Here. Mr. Simmons. Present. Mr. Carter. Present. Mr. Reyes. Present. Mr. Motti. Present. Mr. Kizilbosch. Here. And Mr. Alvarez. Here. Thank you. Thank you. One new announcement, I'd like to uh, move the new business to uh, first on the agenda instead of our pu public hearing. Uh, we would need a vote. Can I just get a, a verbal vote on that? A hands up vote on that from the commissioners? We'd like to move yeah. the accessory structure first so that uh, they won't have to wait for our presentation. Approval a minute. I'm way out of order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, we have our meeting minutes from our April 18, 2019 meeting. We'd like to uh, get a motion to approve the meeting minutes. They've been reviewed as submitted. I'll make a motion that they be approved as submitted the April 18th, 2019 meeting. Second. Mr. Simmons makes a motion and Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Roth makes a motion and Mr. Simmons makes a second, please. Correct. At this time, I would like uh, if Mr. Stokes could uh, get a voice hold. Sorry, voice hold on the minutes. I'm sorry. Okay, can we get a, a, a vote on the meeting minutes, please? Yes. 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 Okay, now that the meeting minutes have been approved properly, we can move on to our next agenda item, which has been changed. We have, uh, now we'll need to vote on that through the commissioners. If, are all the commissioners okay with moving this new business item to the first item on the agenda? Yes. We'll take a, a verbal vote on that. Yes. I guess do roll call for a vote. We're going to move the new business to first item on the agenda before the public hearing. Yeah. Sorry. What's, what's he doing right now? What is he doing? Mr. Reyes? Yeah, yeah. Neither of these items are quasi judicial tonight. So we don't have to swear any of the witnesses or just uh, go into the into the hearings but I, I think that you the you have you, I'm sorry, I think I'm just reading what somebody presented to me here and yeah. it says we're changing an agenda item it yeah. says it requires commissioner votes on it do we have a unanimous vote to change the agenda item to first yes. 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 thank you yeah, oh, yeah. okay <laughs> okay yeah mr. Stokes could you uh yeah, yeah. You're fine. You, you were just taking something out of order, which is the prerogative of the chair. But anyway, we're, we're where we need to be. So you're going to take 
the new business item A first. Okay, so can you fine. read the item uh, title, please, and uh, swear in anybody that's going to be presenting, please? Okay, we're not going to swear in anybody because these aren't quasi-judicial. Okay. Um, but as far as the item... The accessory moment. structure review item, yeah. please. Yes, this is uh, an accessory structure review of the Land Development Code Section 54-2-7.5 at 910 Greenbrier Avenue. Um, at this time, can the applicant please come up or the applicants? Please state your name, address for the, okay. for the public, please. Uh, Robert C. Hatch, 910 Greenbrier Avenue, Sebastian. Okay, if you can uh, let us know a little bit about your project and what your plans are. Okay, well, I purchased the lot next door, a corner lot next to me, to my primary residence, um, in anticipation of not having a builder build a house, number one. And number two, to, you know, landscape it, put a driveway in and a carport that I can put my boat into with a storage shed behind it. I've, since then, I've landscaped. I've kept a perimeter of pine trees. I've planted 12 palms on each corner within the property lines. And uh, I'm going to do more landscaping to make it look nice. And I've had a lot of compliments from my neighbors already. OK. Does the staff have a presentation on it? Yes, this application is before you based on the size. Um, this is a smaller. Um, accessory structure before you. It's only 540 square feet, that 40 extra square feet required it to come and be reviewed by, by the commission. Um, we, uh, through our staff report and our checklist, as you can see, it's not going to be higher than the house. Um, it is a carport, so it is fairly open. Uh, they are going to um, order, it's going to be as close as to matching the house color uh, as can be, as that the, uh, the product uh, allows. Um, they have already pulled their auxiliary driveway permit. The pipe in the right-of-way is in. And and it has been constructed already, it's millings. And uh, I, we did some pictures, we went past the site. It is a corner lot, so there's a 25-foot setback required on that secondary front yard, which they are meeting. I believe their side setback is uh, 50 feet. The, they have kept a nice buffer of trees, um, some palmettos and some pine trees. And based what's on that second lot, they're definitely going to meet the requirement uh, of the double lot landscaping that, that's needed. We do have a unity title on file, and staff recommends approval. Okay. All right, at this time, uh, commissioners, let's start with Mr. Carter. Any no, questions? No comments. No questions. Yes, uh, my only concern is because he's on a corner lot, so he already explained that he's going to put a buffer there. It's very important. Otherwise, it'd be exposed from the street. It's, it's not a good looking structure. It has to be landscaping heavily. Staff has gone by, and there still is a good buffer remaining. I mean, yeah. they have cleared out the peppers. They've cleared out some of the, the grub. They've grubbed yeah. it and brushed. But there's a, a pretty good a buffer still on that corner. Okay. That's my only concern. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mahdi? Uh, the picture that was presented shows the Carolina carport is what you're using. Correct. Uh, question I have, is that going to be placed on a slab or is it going uh, to be? It's, it's a uh, asphalt milling, pressed, rolled. Okay. That's all the only question I have. Yeah. I'm trying to come over to the far end, Mr. Simmons. Okay. okay. Yeah, I have one question, which I'm assuming since 7A is not checked, it's not applicable as far as the, <coughs> as far as the uh, structure, the corrugated metal or anything? Yeah, I, I, if I may answer. I had a question and I, I called the uh, carport area and uh, it's not corrugated, it's just steel, flat steel. I, I wanted to clarify that point also because it wasn't checked. You know. okay. okay. Thank you, that's it. I have no, no, I have no comments. Mr. Ra. Um, just clarification that the driveway is um, milled. Uh, there is a, a storage area in the back of the carport. Is Correct. that going to have a foundation? A it's floor? all it's all one foundation with you know four foot. It's part of the overall thirty by eighteen, and the five by eighteen is part of the structure in the back. And it's got a rolling door for storage. 
And what I was asking is the, the flooring on it. Oh. That, will that be a concrete floor there? Or? No, that's part of the milling also. Milling also, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I was by it. Um, it does have very nice landscaping on the uh, street side. Um, so, and you've done an excellent job on that. Thank you. Uh, my only thought is that the trim, and maybe it's some of the drawings, these aren't always accurate, but it's representative of what you're doing. The trim, uh, will that be to match the house? It's not exactly matching, but I understand it, it has to be similar for 500, over between 500 and 750 square feet. So I actually changed the color to gray, which is the same color as my roof. Okay. Um, so that that's, would be the, the vertical posts and uh, the fascia boards? Yeah, there is no, uh, I don't know if it shows a gable there or not, but that gable, it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, that gable is gone. Oh, okay. Uh, that's just, that was when on the lot when I was buying it. That was a representation. It was, it's actually the same size, but the gable doesn't exist because of the boat going in. Yeah. I, need the, I need that room. <laughs> okay, understand. <laughs> I don't want to hit that. No. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And that's why we ask is because, it, you know, the pictures aren't always exactly right. representative and just to make clear. Correct. So the, the siding on that will be that, uh, I think it was indicated as a, Quaker a gray blue. <clears throat> well, no, I, it's not the blue. I originally had the blue, but they wanted to be a little bit more similar. My second choice was the Quaker gray. So I just went with the Quaker gray. Okay. That's why there was a question on one and yeah. Okay, that's good. So the, that'll be a, a gray. Right. Okay, and the roof color is gray. Is gray. Okay. And I noted that all of your actions in the past have been submitted and approved as far as the driveway, the curb cut, and the milling and all that. So yes, good job on that. Okay, thank you very much. It looks much. fine. Thank you. That's it. Okay. I actually have no questions on this one. Okay. Um, I did have one question was the driveway, but it was answered right away. I guess you didn't know me. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This time, I guess we can, uh, any other commissioner uh, questions on this, this project? The house is very nice. Thank you. Bill did a good, did a good job. Okay, Mrs. Graham, let's take a vote. <laughs> okay, um, I apologize. I, I need a motion for approval for this project. I'll make a motion to approve the application as presented. We have a motion by Mr. Motti. Second. A second by Mr. Simmons. Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Kizzelbosch? Yes. Mr. Roth? Yes. Mr. Simmons? Yes. Mr. Motti? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> you got your carport. Thank you. Thank you very much. You got your carport. <laughs> Okay, so I, I can go back to our regular order of meeting here, which our next item on the agenda. Um, if Mr. Stokes can read the title of it for me, please. Yes, agenda item 6A um, is a review of a proposed comprehensive plan text amendment to the future land use element, conservation and coastal management element, and public facilities element with regards to adaptation of the coastal resiliency plan. This okay. also is not quasi-judicial, it's legislative in nature, so. Okay. Uh, I would imagine we have somebody presenting. Will uh, the city be doing their presentation first, or? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Lisa Frazier, for those of you who don't know. Um, this
this evening, what what has occurred is that we uh, submitted to DEP for a coastal resiliency grant to meet the needs of the legislative um, requirement for it was it was entitled Peril and Flood in order to add that language to our comprehensive plan. It then was changed, and when I say it was changed, it was changed several years ago or maybe last year to make it more of a coastal resiliency plan. So when we went after the grant, it's for coastal resiliency study to be done for the city and then that language to be incorporated into our comprehensive plan. We received a $50,000 grant for this work. We hired our continuing services contract or consultant, Kimley Horn and Associates, to assist us with the plan, which you all have a copy of, which was previously sent. This looks familiar. Um, and now what Kimley Horn is doing in accordance with the grant is that they're adding that applicable language into our comprehensive plan. Now, in a perfect situation, we would then be receiving your input, your recommendation, passing it on to city council who would then bring it up to DEO for incorporation into our, the final incorporation into our comprehensive plan. However, our comprehensive plan needs a complete update by next September. So we don't want to incorporate these things officially yet. What we need to do is continue to work on the comprehensive plan through the next year and, and do the, the complete update, the data and um, analysis that needs to be done with all of our elements and then incorporate the changes that we'll look at this evening. So from here, this information that we talk about this evening and that we pull together, we need to submit it back to DEP to finalize the grant, and we have to do that by the, the end of this month. Um, but then that this information is still gonna be a recommendation from this commission that will eventually be brought to the council when we've taken the time to update all of the data and analysis and look at all of these elements concurrently. Does, I hope that makes sense to everyone. This is not a waste of time. This is a great exercise for us not only to, to get these important elements into our comprehensive plan, but also get this, the planning commission um, used to looking at our comprehensive plan and looking at the changes that we'll, we'll have to uh, approve and incorporate in for the next year. So we're taking a big chunk out of it this evening and I'm really excited to get this done and uh, keep moving forward. Uh, for your information, we've also applied for another grant from DEO, a planning grant um, for $40,000 to help us uh, assist with revising the entire future land use element. We're hopeful to receive those dollars, um, but we won't know until next month. Um, so we're, 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 we're slowly taking chunks out of this big, huge job that we have before us, and we appreciate all of your time and your effort in assisting us in moving forward. Um, so this evening, we have our planning um, consultants here to give us a presentation on what they've done and all of the changes that you have before you. Something that may assist you is the spreadsheet that I submitted to you. This, this kind of gives you a good summary of what the changes are and where they've been incorporated. Um, I've also asked them to do additional, add additional um, policies in the plan, um, and they've done that. So Phil will talk about it tonight. So to pr do the presentation, we have Philip D. Mar La D. Maria and Amanda Brandon from Kimley Horn and Associates. And without further ado, yes? Please, if, thank if you. If I may it. ask of one course. question, and I'm going to ask of the other commissioners, the March of 2019 uh, coastal resiliency plan or study that was done by Kimberly Horn. When was that sent to us? I I, I don't recall 
and I'm, I've been reviewing everything, and it references that constantly. I don't recall receiving it. You were sent a link to the to the document prior oh, to the next meeting. It but is on our website. Tuesday. It was sent to the council for their final approval, because it, this didn't this didn't require the planning and zoning board's review. It it Just required the council. Then? Yes, sir. Um, so the the this is the coastal resiliency plan, which outlines. Um, our vulnerability areas in the city and then some action items. <laughs> now Kimley Horn is taking the parts of this and putting it in the applicable comprehensive plan elements, which is coastal management and, and conservation, along with some portions of the public facilities and the, the future land use element. Remember that um, our conservation and coastal management and public facilities elements have not been updated since 1999. So the data and analysis is woefully behind. Um, and so what we're, tr we're attempting to do as we move forward is to make this document more of a, of a workable document, a document that doesn't just sit on a shelf, but one that we actually can refer to and, and help lead the city um, in their development needs in the future. So one of the concepts um, is to combine the coastal management and conservation elements into one, since they really overlap anyway. Um, you know, in a conservation element, you're going to be talking about your floodplains and preservation of wetlands and, and riparian ways, and yet in coastal management, you're going to be doing the same things because you want to be able to protect those areas in order to help you in your coastal resiliency. So that's that's one of the moves we are making is to combine our coastal management and conservation element into one. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm just surprised that we're only hearing of that on uh, June 5th uh, through an email and yet it was started back in November 2nd, there was a meeting of 2018. Can I ask who represented the city at that meeting, November 2nd, 2018? I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what, on this project. what meeting are we referring to? It was, it was uh, there was a meeting, it was a staff meeting where we did meet with uh, uh, Stormwater, oh. all the departments for to gather and, and they, uh, Kimberly Horn had let us know what information they needed to put together that that coastal resiliency plan. Yes. So it was, it was a staff meeting uh, on, on who was going to get the information, accumulate that okay. together and, and get that to Kimley Horn. And, and that was just for the coastal resiliency plan. That's what was started back in the fall. The comp plan elements were just initiated about a month or so ago after the plan was completed. <laughs> and we were never even updated of any type that this project was started. It was never mentioned in, in any of our meetings. I, that's what puzzles me. But the, the plan did not require the Planning and Zoning Commission's review. This was a plan that was initiated well, by staff, but, but um, approved by the City Council. And we, so it, we may not have been required to authorize it or anything like that, but as a point of information, rather than just on the 5th, having everything presented to us to look at, and then here's the project. I, I should uh, clarify. I just, I, I'm just puzzled at that. Well, and um, I believe more. that uh, if you look in your meeting minutes, this was actually brought to your attention that we had been working on this in the April meeting. So coastal resiliency plan, I did talk to you about that it had been completed and, and finalized and was going to be on the website and that the second part of the grant would be to update certain portions of the comprehensive plan and bring it to this commission for their review. If, if I may, Mr. Roth, uh, we may all have some questions after our consultant presents his, uh, yeah. his uh, presentation for the city's coastal resiliency plan. <coughs> if you don't mind. We would, uh, sir, if you don't mind, you can go ahead with your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, so, uh, Ms. Fraser gave us a really good overview of uh, 
kind of the background and the information as far as the grant process is concerned. I'm just going to really quickly go through some of the background information um, and uh, give you a, a brief overview of what led us to these comprehensive plan amendments that we're presenting tonight. Um, so first thing to start with is the state legislation um, changes that occurred in 2015 that uh, propagated some of the trickle-down effects that lead to some of the municipal changes. Um, then we'll review some of the findings in the resiliency plan and recommendations, one of which was a certain comprehensive plan amendments. Um, we'll go over those specific amendments. Um, and then we have two future resiliency strategies that we just want to put before you tonight, um, get some input on, because uh, as um, Ms. Frazier said, this is just one initiative of many that will be incorporated into the um, final comprehensive plan update. Um, and then finally, we'll open up to questions and comments. So as stated before, the, um, it all began in 2015 with this Peril of Flood Act. Um, it's a Senate bill uh, passed almost unanimously um, and signed by Governor Rick Scott. There are three parts to the bill, but uh, one of which really trickled down to municipal comprehensive plans, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the 2015 Peril Flood Act required Florida coastal communities to address flood risks. Um, so one, keep in mind that it's just coastal communities um, that it applies to, and there are several criteria that it outlines, uh, one of which is high tide events, storm surge, flash floods, stormwater runoff, and sea level rise into the coastal management element of the local government comprehensive plan. Um, there's just some language here, but that's uh, taken directly from Florida statute. So that, that uh, chapter 163 outlines every single local government's comprehensive plan, um, the mandatory requirements within that comprehensive plan, and then also some optional requirements. The Peril of Flood Act was a mandatory requirement um, to incorporate these changes into the comprehensive plan. So we talked about just briefly, uh, Kinley Horn underwent with our stormwater engineers um, this uh, coastal resiliency plan. And really that was a um, engineering look at critical infrastructure within the city, um, which, what pieces of those critical infrastructures, whether they be pipes, whether they be lift stations, whether they be roadways, um, what are the most vulnerable aspects of that infrastructure? Uh, where are they? How vulnerable are, there? are they? And what changes can we make to make those slightly less vulnerable or protected? Um, several things came out of that uh, resiliency plan. Um, we ran several models uh, to come up with certain adaptation strategies. And uh, some of these adaptation strategies were, were cheap and easy to fix. Um, some will probably take some time um, or a significant increase in money. But uh, one of the pieces that's probably the lowest hanging fruit are these comprehensive plan amendments um, that we're going to be discussing today. Um, the vulnerability assessment is prepared to analyze the critical infrastructure, as I stated before, but it really looks at uh, these uh, multivariable flood events. Um, and so we incorporated several uh, different scenarios, one of which was a sea level rise forecast, um, one of which was a 100-year flood forecast, 25-year floods, high tide events, really painting a picture of what is the worst case scenario for the city of Sebastian. What could possibly occur within the next 100 years or 50 years, and how protected or how ready is the city for that event, and what types of impacts would it have to the city's critical infrastructure? We defined existing street and structure levels of service. These are short-term actions. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Um, we locate, uh, or we suggest that we locate and map all city outfalls. We suggest that uh, we retrofit those outfalls with inline check valves to inhibit coastal flooding. And then last but not least, update the comprehensive plan element specific to peril flood and the analysis um, conducted. 
We'll get into the meat of things now. Um, it's not the most exciting stuff, but it does have um, pretty big impacts to uh, how we look at um, future iterations of the comprehensive plan and how the city addresses development in the future along its coastline. The goal of this was to incorporate this resiliency plan into the comprehensive plan. And I'll zoom out just a little bit, and this will become part of the um, discussion uh, during the full comprehensive plan update. But what happens during these comprehensive plan updates is cities undergo plans and analyses during that time, as Ms. Fraser spoke about, um, and incorporate that into their data and analysis. And all of this new data and analysis that has occurred over the last 30 years since 1999, in this case for the coastal um, and conservation elements, um, are applicable and should ref be reflected within the um, respective elements. Um, and so this 2019 Coastal Resiliency Plan really uh, generated the most current and um, modern uh, resources to uh, generate a, a modern data and analysis for the plan. Um, incorporating these into the comprehensive plan um, is important just to reflect um, mit potential mitigation strategies, also to update the uh, elements with coastal development best practices and recognize the risk and potential impacts of flooding. Um, and then also, and uh, probably both most importantly and least importantly um, for the city itself, but to comply with state statute. So uh, I'll just take this time um, as an opportunity to, to speak about state statutes and the importance of complying with those state statutes that allows the city to continue um, to receive grant money, um, to uh, receive um, state stipends for certain items. Um, it allows insurance uh, claims to stay low um, or uh, insurance rates to stay low. And all of these uh, pieces of the pie um, are, are important to making sure that the city of Sebastian uh, is in good favor with the state. So Kimley, the Kimley Horn planning team um, began with a uh, review of the current policies, objectives, and goals um, in the three major elements. Those are the land use element, public facilities element, and coastal management and conservation elements. Um, I say three here because eventually we're, we're looking to combine the coastal management and conservation elements, which currently exist as two separate chapters. Um, so. Uh, when we began our analysis, there were four separate elements um, that we found really, really high level and relevant opportunities for change. Um, city staff reviewed these proposed changes based on best practices and the resiliency plan, um, and we came to an agreement on a, a draft of uh, comprehensive plan amendments. Um, when we began drafting the comprehensive plan amendments, we found that there were 12 opportunities within the land use element to recognize the resiliency plan, eight amendments within the public facilities element to recognize the resiliency plan, and then finally in the coastal management and conservation elements, which is probably where we spent the most of our time and energy, um, um, we found the opportunity to consolidate the two chapters uh, six objectives within those chapters, 12 policies, um, resulting in a unified conservation and coastal management element, um, and then also opportunities to take direct language from the plan and incorporate it within um, that element to make sure that any future uh, land development code updates, comprehensive plan updates, are all consistent with this um, latest and greatest analysis that we conducted as part of the 2019 uh, Coastal Resiliency Plan. Um, once again, uh, there are certain reasons why we looked at the coastal management and conservation elements um, as an opportunity for consolidation. Um, first of all, and, and uh, probably most important is the functionality and readability of the document. Um, we see very often across the state uh, these documents that truly sit on shelves. 
no one opens them, they're dusty. They don't get opened in 30 years, right? I mean, this, this one hasn't been opened since 1999. So there was a real opportunity here um, to, to uh, make it a functional um, document that uh, city staff, yourselves, um, city council members can point to and say, uh, you know, within our comprehensive, what does it say inside of our comprehensive plan? Um, what type of consistency do they have with that? Um, how can we make it a document that is uh, readable and uh, truly usable? Um, and so taking that kind of approach is something that is, uh, there have been more opportunities in recent years um, because of changes at the state level and uh, using those opportunities here at a local level is something that we advise. Um, we updated the element to rectify invalid cross-references and element references. Um, moving around uh, certain goals, objectives, and policies could lead to uh, either some confusion or um, just opportunities to really cross-reference and make sure that everything's pointing the right way. Um, we deleted several dates within the comprehensive uh, plan element, this one specifically. Uh, they make updates uh, in the plan to code changes. Um, so part of our analysis was looking back at land development code updates that have occurred over the years um, to find whether or not those changes were made that were mandated by the comprehensive plan and um, you know, deleting those references if they had been made and if they haven't been made, then uh, retaining them within. Um, and once again, that resulted in six fewer objectives, 12 fewer policies, and 10 fewer pages, which I think is an important uh, piece to note here. You took two elements, combined them together, retained all of the very, very important high-level things, and also added some resiliency language, um, some things that will lead to, the, to a more resilient city, and resulted in 10 fewer pages. I think that's kind of neat. Um, I can spend as little or as much time as you want on these, um, but these are the, the specific listing of those amendments. Um, if you prefer, I'll run through them very quickly, and then if you have any questions, we can address those um, after the fact. But um, there are two new uh, conservation um, policies or objectives added. Um, Pieces of this include adding just a brief description to explain that the two chapters were consolidated. Um, that's a kind of a state statute concern. We need to address that uh, these, these elements satisfy state statute um, needs and requests. Uh, a new goal to encompass the goals of both coastal management and conservation. We edited several objectives and policies under those objectives that were redundant or um, were no longer relevant. We saw opportunities to move objectives uh, underneath others that, uh, where it made sense, where we talked about habitat, um, we, we took other pieces of the plan that also spoke about habitats for manatees or sea turtles and, uh, or pelicans and moved them um, under each other so that it readed more, fun uh, more functionally. Um, we looked at opportunities for um, uh, best management practices as well. So there were several uh, pieces of the resiliency plan that talked about um, uh, development types and uh, development design standards. Um, so encouraging those development design standards within the plan was, was addressed. Um, we merged several objectives um, and consolidated policies just to increase uh, the readability of the plan as stated previously. There's certain resiliency plan uh, language also added under several objectives. Um, and you, you'll probably see in several parts of references to the resiliency plan as well. Um, that is a state statute option rather than repeating ourselves over and over, um, just uh, adopting by reference. And that gives us the ability to uh, create updates uh, more functionally and appropriately. These are just several other objectives that were modified. Um, oh, excuse me to interrupt you for sure. a second. All this that you're saying, is that in here? Correct, sir. Okay. Yeah. 
And then I'll just, I just wanted to give us some examples of these amendments as well. Um, so we can talk about uh, maybe um, how the resiliency plan was incorporated into this comprehensive plan. So the uh, first one here is um, in the uh, chapter five, which is our new conservation and coastal management element. Um, it's policy 5171 and really addresses uh, directing populations away from known areas that are vulnerable to flooding and inundation and sea level rise. Um, these are areas that are addressed within the Coastal Resiliency Plan. Um, so this is just one example of how we can take data and analysis performed as part of a, a stormwater management uh, plan and address it in the comprehensive plan and the type of impacts that it could have on um, future generations within the city of Sebastian. Um, the second one is taken from the public facilities element, um, and it describes the, uh, the importance of mitigation strategies within um, the coastal resiliency plan, um, discusses some of the uh, impacts that water and flooding and future sea level rise will have on pump stations and the necessity to harden those pump stations in a way that will um, allow critical infrastructure to continue to perform despite any type of flooding or inundation. Um, the third one um, discusses the effect also on public facilities um, and it just quickly talks about development and redevelopment strategies. Now this is something that's important to keep in mind because uh, in a moment I'm gonna discuss some high level holistic strategies that we've been pouring over with staff um, for incorporation into the greater comprehensive plan update. But um, you'll see a line here that talks about development and redevelopment strategies should be used to reduce flood risk in these areas. Um, defined by the Florida statute, and it also discusses existing street and structure flooding levels of service. Um, so what we're discussing here is opportunities for, um, in the f for future development and redevelopment to occur in places that um, can truly uh, support um, through the use of infrastructure, uh, uh, increased population and development. So what are the results of these amendments? Uh, the results are that the, uh, they assist in better reflecting the threats of flooding and sea level rise while simultaneously improving the comprehensive plans organization structure. Once again, that readability functionality piece. Um, and then it also integrates resiliency into the comprehensive plan. And uh, that, that draws upon what I uh, spoke about earlier um, when discussing how several initiatives are taken during, between these comprehensive plan updates. And this is just one thread of many that will um, be tied into the comprehensive plan update moving forward. Um, and several other initiatives um, and pieces of this will uh, continue to be threaded along. Um, here are those future comprehensive plan resiliency strategies for consideration. Um, we have two um, really holistic land use strategies that um, are being used uh, by several communities, coastal and otherwise, um, to direct uh, development away from these very critical uh, land uses. And when I speak about land uses, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing the, the type of land itself rather than the use of the land in terms of a zoning strategy or something like that. But um, these are two broad-based strategies that could be used to um, really enforce resiliency and incentivize resiliency into the built environment. Uh, the first strategy, strategy is establishing a adaptation action area. Um, and this would just be an area of the city um, that has specific land use regulations. Um, and then the second one is establishing a transfer of development rights program with sending and receiving zones. Um, uh, locally, uh, St. Lucie County has a, has a pretty broad-based TDR program um, where they they encourage compact um, development um, in their North St. Lucie area. Um, so taking um, that same 
frame of thought in terms of incentivizing certain things um, and disincentivizing other things um, is really the basis for the TDR program. And I'll discuss each of these a little th more thoroughly. Um, so strategy one, establishing an adaptation action area. Um, the map on the right is uh, f taken from uh, our coastal resiliency plan, the 2019 coastal resiliency plan. Um, and those oranges and reds are really seen as areas that are um, probably in line for uh, the largest threat to both sea level rise or some type of inundation risk. And uh, the we same- We saw that in 2004, so. I'm sorry? We saw that in 2004. Okay. Believe me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and I mean, this is nothing new, right? No, of course. It's, it's uh, the ocean doing what the ocean does. Um, and uh, the tide doing what the tide does, uh, you know. Um, but this is just an example of maybe places within um, the city that are most vulnerable to, um, you know, whether it be climate change or um, some other type of inundation risk or, or just flooding from a 100-year storm event. Um, and so the AAA is just an overlay district that would cover uh, pieces of the city most vulnerable um, you would adopt this overlay district based on the data analysis and the modeling outlined in the Coastal Resiliency Plan. So we already have established a baseline of um, uh, vulnerability areas. And then uh, we would suggest that development within this, within this overlay district uh, comply with certain best practices. Um, that would be flood resistant design, construction engineering solutions. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers has um, you know, uh, several documents that talk about flood risk um, in coastal areas, and that's just one of those items. Uh, low impact development techniques um, that utilize uh, natural features, um, whether it be kind of green stormwater solutions, green infrastructure, um, those are the types of things that we're talking about within this area. Excuse me. Um, an example objective, since we're talking about comprehensive plans here, um, and by no means is this uh, completely thorough, but just to give you an idea of what you might see if you, if you like this type of strategy, um, is the objective and policy below. Um, so establishing an adaptation action area overlay district to minimize future risk, the city shall establish an AAA um, for areas that are vulnerable to coastal flooding and the impacts of sea level rise based on the data and modeling outlined within the coastal resiliency plan. Um, an example policy would say within the land development code, the city of Sebastian shall establish criteria for low impact design, flood resistant design for new development and redevelopment within the AAA. So that's, that's that um, kind of trickle down um, in action. You have a uh, state bill that's signed in 2015, legislation that makes its way into Florida statute in 2017 with certain language, uh, moving its way into a comprehensive plan that's addressed in several different ways. The second strategy is establishing the transfer development rights program that I discussed earlier. Um, and that, that you, we could use several different areas for that. We could use a coastal high hazard area that's already um, been adopted as part of uh, the city's comprehensive plan as well as uh, several other municipalities and local municipalities comprehensive plans um, uh, and create a sending zone. So this is a, a little bit, um, uh, and forgive me if, if you're familiar with these types of TDR programs, but I'll give you just a basic overview. Um, so the idea behind transferring development rights is that you have sending zones and receiving zones. And you're taking development rights uh, from one parcel of property, um, let's say it's in a sending zone, and uh, it can be developed to 10 units an acre. Um, but the person there says, I'm gonna develop it to five units an acre, and I could take those extra five units of acre that I'm not using and sell it to someone else. or uh, conversely, they could not develop the property at all and sell those 10 units to someone else. We would say here that those units, an acre or square footage of commercial space um, could only be taken from that property if it lands somewhere else. And that uh, somewhere else would be a receiving zone. So that receiving zone, we would identify areas that are upland that have no risk of inundation um, and say direct the density there. 
We can be very specific or not specific about where exactly those receiving zones are. Um, you know, I, I, there are several areas of the city that are upwind that I would suggest we, st we still wouldn't send density or intensity. Um, but that's just something uh, to consider. But that's the general idea behind a transfer of development rights program is you're taking development rights from a place you don't want to see development and putting it in a place where it's more appropriate. Um, and I think most importantly, and um, you know, something that is always a concern of uh, local officials as well as uh, maybe the city attorney is takings. So a transfer of development rights program um, really allows uh, the city to incentivize uh, development in certain areas, disincentivize developments in certain areas without necessarily taking property rights. Uh, and once again, just a uh, really quick example of uh, what that would look like in a comprehensive plan um, through an objective and a policy. And I'll spare you uh, hearing my voice uh, read that to you. Um, other than that, um, unless Thank you very much, and, and um, I just want to make sure that the commission understands that everything in yellow and blue, well, blue has been changed, has shown, shows a change, but mainly it's all the, all the items that have been, that are underlined are new, okay, are the new additions. Um, in the conservation and coastal management element, there's a lot of yellow and blue and underlines going on because they combined both those elements. So it, it's just kind of showing that they took one and put it all in, into, to, they took two and combined it into one, I should say. I think that it, it's, if you haven't already, the easiest way of really looking at what has been changed is utilizing the spreadsheet in front of you to really <laughs> recognize what has happened. Um, I guess that's about it for now. If you have any questions of Philip. Can you go back and explain the, the yellow and the underlined one more time? Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, all we were trying to do is call attention to um, the edits that were being made within the plan. So um, in traditional sense, when, when we're updating any type of document, we would underline specific text and strike through any text that we're removing. Um, just highlighting um, is it, just a way to call attention to those items that were edited. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank this you. Time I, like. I had questions. Uh, <clears throat> what would be the situation of a development right for the people, so we're going to change all the zoning again based on these, these plans, comprehensive plan. Uh, are we developing also the mitigation <coughs> plans, the mitigation things? If the people cannot build on certain property because of this comprehensive plan, what right they have to develop and they have to go through mitigations or what we have to do? Well, to answer, that's very actually a very good applicable question. We didn't change any development rights, and we won't be by the acceptance of these changes today. Um, we already have an existence in our comprehensive plan and in our land development code that in areas of sensitive um, lands, such as floodplains, wetlands, even the river, the riparian area, um, <coughs> that they have to uh, comply by certain regulations and permitting in order to develop. I mean, that, that will not change. That has not changed. Um, what is going to be the biggest change is just recognizing that um, we have these areas that are vulnerable and then trying to take mitigation action through our land development codes. And it's mainly geared towards public facilities. And one of the good things that was determined in this plan by our engineers and our staff is that most of our public facilities are in good shape, and it's because we've built those up on high ground. We don't have a lot down out by the coast or out by the river. 
um, and help me, Philip, if I'm not explaining this correctly. So we want to be able to incorporate into the plan the recognition of these vulnerable areas in some of the action plans that are in this this plan. We're um, updating our stormwater master plan and making sure some of our um, septic pumps, the critical ones, the ones that are critical for the safety and welfare of the public, not private individual septic pumps, but more of the, the public ones, that they are, uh, have been raised up or have been bolstered so that during floods or during catastrophes, they'll continue to function. And I believe there was only a handful at best, <clears throat> and there, there are Indian River County pumps that are in these critical areas, but there are actions that, you know, we can encourage Indian River County to do in order to bolster these critical pumps. Um, those are really the major changes that we're making right now. I know it looks like a lot of changes because of all the yellow and the underlining, but again, quite frankly, it's more of the combining of both of those elements and of the, the conservation and the coastal management element into one that looks like there, that there was a lot more changes than there are. Now to answer your question regarding like TDRs or um, um, doing the action area. The areas, let's think of uh, nothing's going to be changed if we, incur, if we put in a policy and state uh, the city may want to consider um, enacting or looking at transfer of development rights you know, as a, as a utilization, that's just a policy statement. If we say the city may want to consider, it has a whole different meaning than the city shall enact TDR rights. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So if, and this is a strategy we don't, we, we want to consider this evening, but we don't have to put into place this evening because this is gonna come up again and again to your, uh, for your consideration. Um, but if we just want to be able to look at it and consider it for certain areas that we know are at risk for coastal flooding. Um, let me give you an, an example. Some of the small lots along Riverside, along, along the river right there, a lot of them are joined up with the larger lot across from Indian River Drive on the west side, correct? Perhaps if there are TDRs, the small lots along the river, if a, you're, you're a lot owner and you really can't build on that lot along the river, you could take some of those development rights and put it over to your lot on the west side. That's just an example of a, a sending and a receiving okay. zone that somebody we could consider establishing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. The other thing that I would really like us to consider in the future as a strategy, uh, one of the action items is to update our stormwater master plan. I would really like us to um, have, have a policy to look at and support uh, low impact design and best management practices with our stormwater management plan. A lot of our lots in the city are already developed. And so if you want to redevelop, you don't have a lot of room for storm water to, to treat and store and, and move the storm water off your site. So a lot of it just goes directly into the, you know, the, the roadway storm water system and then flushes directly into the lagoon. And giving these property owners the ability to get credit for um, in, installing low impact design criteria or best management practices within their lots uh, really helps them and it'll help the lagoon in the long run. So a policy statement such as that, you know, we encourage the city to consider low impact design best management practices within the stormwater management plan that's a policy we may want to consider or strategy in the future. 
that's, that's where we're gonna be moving towards as we update this comprehensive plan for the next year. Well, we're doing so much work here. We don't have much area, actually. We, it's already developed. Most, most, most of the city limits are already developed. Only a few areas along uh, Indian River Drive, you know. So, to me, it's okay mm. what we're doing here. But as long as we don't restrict any zoning things and any other thing, because some of the lot which you mentioned, they are not on the west side or Indian. That's my concern with the, the development right. I hear, I understand exactly, and, and I want to assure you that we're not taking anybody's rights away, and we're not saying you have to do it. We're just offering it as an incentive. Anything that we would put in here would be an offering of incentive, unless we feel very strongly of something, and then it will be the city shell. <laughs> so there's different language that one uses, and, and Mr. Stokes backed me up on that. It's either the city will consider, or the city may, may want to consider, and then, then this gives us direction for the future in that consideration. If, if this commission or the city council really wants something to happen, then it will be the city shell. So that kind of language you have to be very careful with in your policies. Because whatever is, is in the plan, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the plan is the comprehensive development plan of the city. And so what's in this plan should also be reflected in our land development codes and in our zoning codes. And, and that is what Philip was trying to bring forth to you in some of the changes that were done you know, in the 1999 element, it was stating this will be done by this date. And so what him and his team did was they went back through our whole land development code and compared and seen, made verified that it was done and, you know, when it was done. And so then the language was changed instead of having the date of 19, you know, 99 when it was supposed to be done, you know, this will continue to be supported, was added. Does that make sense for you? So those are a lot of the changes that were done in order to update this plan. Um, most of the major changes are just referencing the Coastal Resiliency Plan and the action items within it, which was to um, update, the major things were to update the Stormwater Man Management Plan and what was number two? Um, the hardening. Uh, the hardening, yes of the bulkheads and the lift stations. You're correct. Okay. I just want to add to, and maybe I'm simplifying it, but for those that, are, we, we haven't worked with the comp plan a lot. You, you see it every how many years when we bring a text change. So there are, are certain amount of elements that the Florida statutes requires us to have. Each one of those elements has two sections. There's your data and analysis, which is where so say for like the future land use, it's gonna tell you know, how much square miles the city has, of those square miles, how many are single family homes, how much multifamily do we have? It's a section that gives us a lot of data. From that, you, you go into your goals, objectives, and policy section, and that's what this is where this is we're working on. You have a policy, and then, uh, I'm sorry, you have a goal that you said this is the goal of the city, and then you have under there, you're gonna have a certain amount of policies that get you to achieve that goal. That trickles down then once that's all ad adopted to then how do we how do we achieve those goals with our policies by changing the land development code. So that's just a really simple version. But I wanted to explain that there there are two sections in each of those elements that we do have data and analysis, and then you have your goals, objectives, and policies. And that's what we're working on here is getting those goals and then setting up the policies under that for these elements to adopt to adapt the coastal resiliency uh, ideas. I don't mean to totally change the subject, but just uh, there is a reference made by, you know, updating everything from a 1999 plan, and the plan I have is April 2009. So is that indicating that something was done in 1999 that was not updated in 2009? The so what I have is not a complete comprehensive plan? You don't have the complete comprehensive plan. Um, what you have is the, there's in the, one of the elements that Kimley Horn added to and updated 
was uh, the future land use element, and that was updated in 2009. So that's the element that you're looking at that's 2009. However, the other three elements that they updated are from 1999, and that's the coastal management, the conservation, and the public facilities. So we need to do our work in, in updating the data and analysis for those elements before we can take all of this to DEO for approval. We did a lot of work in 2009. That's why I'm surprised that you did a lot, lot of work in 2009. That, <laughs> that wasn't done. No, it was in 2009, but those three elements were not updated at that time. Correct. I think out of the nine or seven that we had, there was four or five that we updated in 2009 through the year process, the evaluation appraisal report. And That's but, right. So you do have a complete plan. It's just some of those elements haven't been updated since 1999. So our job today, excuse me to interrupt here, is to approve this. Is yes, that what sir. you want us to do here today to approve this plan? We are we are looking for your recommendation for approval okay. that the changes that have been made um, are compatible with the comprehensive plan, and um, that they will then be uh, reviewed again at another time when we get the data and analysis updated for these elements because this is now going to be sent to the DEO in order to complete our grant and complete our legislative uh, requirements. What we have here today. That is correct. Okay. Mr. Simmons? I, yes, I have the one question, like in Chapter 5, it happens to do with floodplains and wetlands and so on and so forth. It's all been deleted, scratched through. So it, it, and I guess the question was, was it useless verbiage to start with or is it somewhere else? Uh, that's, uh, I'm going to venture a guess and I'll look to Amanda to confirm, but um, any critical information was consolidated into the, to the unified chapter. So anything to do with wetlands or um, you know, habitats. Woods and hardwoods and it was not deleted, sir. <coughs> not at all. No, it's been element. all incorporated together. Our and protection of the floodplains and our coastal okay. areas, we are very much still doing that. <laughs> and that language is in our comprehensive plan, and, and it has been trickled down to the Land Development Code. Thank you. I'll ask a few questions. On your analysis, uh, your engineers are using what, what lidar data for they're using for the ground. I know recently it was it's been updated. Did they use the recent data? Our flood maps have been updated for our areas also. Uh, so I'm curious on that. Uh, you're removing a lot of swim language. You're not modeling with swim anymore. Why is all the language being removed? Uh, you're modeling for 100 or 50 to 100 year storms. I know from uh, from experience that we have exceeded that with storms in the past, so engineering should know that. So I'm just curious why we still model for a 50 to 100 year storm instead of trying to model above that. So some, some survey related to engineering questions. Uh, on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll caveat everything by saying that I'm not an engineer, um, <laughs> and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, but uh, yeah, really great questions. We had a kickoff meeting, and I think that's what was referenced um, for the November meeting, where uh, several um, engineers from both the county, um, I think from uh, also from the Water Management District, Kimley Horns engineers, uh, city staff. Um, and we all came together and discussed data needs, availability, what updates were occurring, whether it be LIDAR, firm status, um, really all the maps and analysis that could possibly go in. Um, we received GIS data from uh, Indian River County regarding their uh, as built their as-built and their lift stations. Um, and uh, we tried to absolutely be as thorough as we possibly could, use the latest and greatest data. Um, I believe that there's a uh, data source there inside the plan, um, and I, I don't have the plan in front of me. If you'd like to list it, feel free. I, but I, if, I, 
probably. Beginning of the meeting, so yeah. I just thought I'd email throw them out, and then we can all hear Absolutely. it. Um, sure. Dealing with that kind of data all the time, uh, lack of hospital data is uh, very common. Mm -hmm. And you say you know they haven't been opened in years, and sometimes you can't even find data. So absolutely, I, I, I just thought I'd throw those questions. Yeah, out. hey, Thank great you. questions, and um, we absolutely tried to be as diligent as uh, humanly uh, possible. Okay, I have I've had heard mention of check valves on other municipalities. Um, requires a lot of maintenance. Is this the, the final plan on some of your outfalls to, to, to retrofit them with check valves to eliminate, or is this is just really early in stages? It's just to get our grants. No, no, well, yes, yes, and yes. This is the plan to show where some of the vulnerabilities are. And now, you know, we are moving towards updating our stormwater master plan. And in that plan, we're going to be, you know, really doing some hard analysis of our outfalls and our um, seawalls and making sure that, that, that those type of things have been um, hardened, I guess, is the word I want. Again, I'm not an engineer, so <laughs> sorry if I'm not getting the correct terminology. You should read, you should read the report, Mr. Reyes. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I will. I'm going to go home and read it. It's, it's I'll, very, I'll very report fascinating. To you tomorrow. <laughs> and, it's, and it's well, and it's well I read this all the time. I don't know that I want to go home and read it. No, I, I, I hear you, but I'm, I'm sorry that you missed the presentation that the engineer from Kimley Horn actually uh, did for the Alex council. X, X absent that, that day. Yeah, it was I, very, very good. Uh, one other question. Um, I'm concerned about the transfer development rights. Um, okay. Purchasing wetland bank rights. Or, um, is, there a, a, is there a rule? Say I'm developing a five-acre lot on the river. Uh, is there a percentage rule right now that we, that we follow uh, say you want to develop five acres, and uh, we want them to you not, you know, maybe there's some wetlands or some, some, some. Uh, I guess it's a touchy subject. Mr. Stokes will probably correct me on this. Well, let, let me um, give you a good example. So, if you have five acres and one acres is a designated wetland area, it doesn't have any development rights. I have an answer for that. <laughs> Thank. You. Yeah, if you don't touch the wetland. You okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. But when you touch the wetland, then you have to go through mitigation process through DEP. Those and things. they they all set what the threshold is. They will, they, will, they will value that thing, how much it will be impact, and they will tell you the fine what's to do. Thank you. <laughs> that that yeah, is that, absolutely that, correct. Thank you. I I just want the rest of our commissioners yes, to be uh, aware of that. But I, I just also want you to be aware that, again, if you have a five-acre site and one acre is wetlands, that one acre doesn't have any development rights. So the four acres would have development rights. And if you chose to, you know, want to preserve that lot, somebody could buy the lot and hence buy the development rights and transfer them somewhere else where then it would be a little bit more density. Let me give you an example, Liberty Park here that's going up in the county here, right just south of 510. They um, have purchased several pieces of property in the county south of us and have taken those development rights off those pieces of property and transferred those densities into Liberty Park. So it is happening in different areas. So then Liberty Park can have a little bit more development rights, that, that piece of property, that development, and these other pieces of property remain undeveloped in perpetuity. So that's, that's a good example. So, so as we have it now, we, we may or may not make them uh, or, um, subject to having purchase development rights or to develop, say, you, you brought up where shall and may. Right. Now, 
Can you explain that a little bit? <laughs> well, what I would recommend is that if this board wants to explore and thinks this has some legitimacy for the city, then the, the policy statement would be the city of Sebastian, and I'm making this up on the fly, but the city of Sebastian uh, may consider um, investigating transfer right. of development rights for utilization and coastal resiliency in the city. Something as simple as that. Then when that's a policy, that's just telling staff, we want, we want to look at this. Okay. It doesn't change anything because as you all know, nothing can get changed until it goes before you all and then the city council. So then if we put together a whole TDR study, we bring it to this commission and you say, no, we don't recommend that this goes any further, it wouldn't go any further. If you say this has legitimacy, we'd like it to, you know, be part of our land development codes, then it would go to the city council. I think a good example that could be more locally um, understand how it would work for the city is I have had quite a few, not only say quite a few, but some calls regarding tiny home subdivisions. But you know that our zoning, our RM8, our medium density, only allows eight units per acre. But when you're doing tiny homes and eight units per acre, a lot of times the acreage is not financially feasible for them to do only eight units, uh, eight tiny homes on an acre. They're looking to get more density. So if, as explained in one of the strategies, if we were to do an overlay of an action area for say some of the lots along the river, um, because some of those with, uh, in the mixed zoning, they are allowed eight units per acre too. If somebody, if we, did if we decided to go that transfer development rights, we could say that you could purchase those lots or those rights from those lots. Those lots would then have to do some sort of document that says we're not going to build on these lots, but we could transfer those units to a developer that wanted to do a tiny home village, and now maybe he can get 12 or 16 units per acre for a tiny home. So it, you know, it may help with some developments to be able to take some of those properties out of those vulnerable areas, an overlay, but we can use it for a benefit of something, you know, we, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna get 30 homes on an acre now or something, but on a tiny home, that those development uh, transfer of rights would help that type of development, that type of subdivision. Thank you, that was, that was a great explanation. It's kind of an overlay we would be doing for the, those coastal areas that we want to protect. Yeah. Question on the impact to adjoining areas when someone using that example would use eight, eight homes uh, and they bought right somewhere else and added it to it. Uh, now they have, say, they use 12. What happens to the adjoining properties? Does that... Um, Zoning of those adjoining properties have any impact on that transfer rate? No, they wouldn't change. No, and the zoning wouldn't change either. It still would stay at RM8, eight units per acre, but it would, you know, through some documents and recorded uh, documents and legal documents, you would get those those units from the properties that now are not going to get developed, but it would not change the zoning. We would still consider it on our rate. We're not changing the, the land use or the maximum density. You're just transferring some of those development rights. Okay, so if it was R1 residential adjoining an R8 or multifamily, that that would have no bearing on it. Uh, no, and we already have we have uh, ordinances in place already that if you're multifamily up against single family, there's additional buffering, um, you know, landscape buffers, setbacks, things like that um, that we could that we already have in place. Um, similarly, that's what I, for, I just wanted to clarify that to make sure that that still stays in effect. Okay, thank you. I've got a question. I thought I read in here mm -hmm. somewhere it mentions something about design standards, or did I not see something? Well, you that you, we wanted to keep the spirit of the design of what Sebastian was supposed to be the fishing type village. Did I read something in here about that? I, I'm sure you, you, you did, Mr. Motti, because a lot of the language hasn't been changed. So I'm sure that that, that would still be in there, I would imagine. I, I couldn't tell you exactly where at this point, but. I, I, I thought I saw it, but when, when we get to that issue, and this is probably down the line somewhere, wouldn't it be, or should it be considered that we do have a design standard that we're looking for? 
Oh, here it is. I found it for you. You found it. Where is it? <laughs> um, it's under the future land use, and you ha it's under policy 1-2.9.6, preservation of existing assets within the riverfront, and it talks about uh, implement implementing the old Florida fishing village theme. And I believe we, we talked about this in April, and I did scan in the document that um, was the charrette, correct, that occurred and where they came up with the old fishing village theme. I scanned it in, it is now in the files. If you would like a copy of it, please let me know. I'll print it out and it'll be at the front desk in our office. Mr. Mahdi, one, okay. One. <laughs> um, two. Uh, I, I, I agree with, once you look at this, I agree mm -hmm. with the thought that we could tighten this up or maybe reinvestigate this in the future. And again, that's a policy statement. You know, we have here that we want to um, implement the old Florida fishing village theme, but a policy could be, you know, we may want to consider a design um, criteria. Design criteria, tightening up what that really means. You know, re-looking at that. I mean, that's that's that is a policy statement that could then be incorporated in here. All right. Maybe not necessarily at this time. We're going to really get into the future land use plan in the future. Um, but in this one, they were just trying to talk about um, the riverfront and making sure that we recognize that coastal resiliency is, should be looked at and, and considered in, in the riverfront. Manner, correct. Right. Okay. Any more deliberation or questions from the commissioners? Okay. I'm going to ask for a motion. No. Call for a motion. Approved. This is just a review. We have to approve this thing. It's a review. No, I, w I would appreciate it if this commission, standing as the LPA, the Land yes. Planning Agency, um, recommends that these changes be incorporated into the comprehensive plan for That's future right transmittal. Yeah. Yeah. To the, to the city council. I'll make that motion. I'm going to make no. a motion but to it make it incorporated in the future. incorporate these new notes and uh, to the public hearing uh, on the review of proposed comprehensive plan text amendments to the future land use development, conservation and coastal management element, and public facilities element with regards to adaptation of the coastal resiliency plan. I'll second that. Roll call, please. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Roth? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. Mr. Motti? Yes. Mr. Kizzelbosch? Yes. Mr. Simmons? Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous in favor. Thank you. Did a great, great presentation. Ms. Frazier, you're doing a great job on our comprehensive plan. I did attend the uh, train your commissioners, I believe it was, and it was it's been great help for this. So. Well, I, I really I spent appreciate. Spent a lot of time that. reviewing this. Unfortunately, I missed the link on the email, but I will review it, and I may have further questions. This is early stages. Kimberly Horn did a great job for us. Well, I really appreciate this commission's patience and their forethought because it's going to be a big job in front of us this next year. So. We really, really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Okay. okay. May, may I ask, what is the next step on this process? So now we're going to take what you all recommended is, is, is the changes. Um, we're going to compile all of this and send it up to DEP. And so we'll be complete with that grant and with these changes in the comp plan. They are not going to be formalized yet. 
um, quite frankly, we have in the budget to begin this work, hopefully, um, right in October 1st. <laughs> uh, if I do, if I am successful in getting the grant from DEO, we may be able to start the future land use portion of it before October 1st. But then we're going to go hard and heavy on getting the data and analysis updated for all of these elements and start really compiling them. If this is a good time to tell us staff and Kimley Horn, is this a good way for you all to, to, to simplify your review without the having to read it? Yeah. For the, me, the, the break, but breaking it down helps. Uh, yes, it does. Okay. As long as we get it in a timely fashion. Yes. I still have not gotten it. I do apologize, Ms. Turner. I don't know what happened to your, to your mail. I truly, I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I think we can uh, we can offer up that when it when it does have something to do with the comprehensive plan when there's a lot of reading we'll hand deliver. You know there's, there's sometimes it doesn't getting it in the mail sending you a link um, taking that staff time with the car to deliver it to you which we always do with site plans it just sometimes is it economically uh, the best way to do it. But if it's something with comp plan and there's a lot to read we'll go back to the hand deliver and putting a package by your door if that works out for the comprehensive plan review. I think that may be best then. And what we could also do is uh, let's say we send something out to you on Friday but it's not for the second meeting in the queue. So that kind of gives you maybe even a whole month or three weeks to, to, to read it and really look at it and that call be, us with questions. Yeah, that would be more advisable because there's a lot to comprehend in this. And yeah. we don't want to make mistakes or right. recommendations to you. Absolutely. And this would give you a chance to call us and talk to us about things or even sit down and go, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? We cannot express to you how much we appreciate your time. We understand it's volunteer, and I really, hats off, hence your, your gifts in front of you tonight. We, um, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of meetings that we don't have any agenda items. I'm willing to come in here for a lecture on this kind of stuff. Or an update. Or an update. <clears throat> this was coming up. You guys knew you were going to do this. I would have came. You know, it, it's sure we don't have agenda items, but maybe as staff, you you can't just set up meetings when there's no agenda items. But that that would be a good item to review with us up here. Uh, so I know we've had two or three meetings that were canceled because lack of agenda items. That would have been a great agenda item. Just a comment of mine. Uh, good luck with your grant. Fifty thousand is not a lot of money. You can barely scratch the surface of that. I hope you guys get a lot more grant money. Uh, you know, I see some detailed surveying. There's a lot of stuff involved in this in the future, and you're not going to scratch the surface with fifty grand. So, hopefully, the people approving grants are listening and they can give <laughs> us a little more. <laughs> I hope so. And, uh, Yes. Do you know where this money is? Do we already have it allocated for any particular project, or if uh, we do get it, or we just the, the fifty thousand dollars that we we received for the coastal resiliency plan? It was for the plan, and then phase two was incorporating the plan into the comprehensive plan. So that fifty thousand will be reimbursed to us from DEO. So that work was, and that's that was the contract with Kimley Horn. So we didn't have to pay a dime, which was really, really wonderful. Um, to update, to properly update a complete comprehensive plan is quite costly. Hence my looking for other grant dollars to help alleviate some of that cost. And so I went after a $40,000 grant with DEO just recently just for the future land use element alone. And again, we're hopeful. How much of our, um, I think it was last year we approved a, a stormwater tax. Mm -hmm. How much of that money is just going to this kind of, uh, none? I, I couldn't, not for a comprehensive plan, but it okay. may be going towards the stormwater master plan, but that's really a, a question more for the city manager. I, I attended a council meeting on that where there was some discussion on it, and there was a lot of projects that that uh, I think the money were going to be applied to that, and it really wasn't... Uh, 
updating our stormwater master plan. It's like the monies from the tax are being taken to finish some road projects or something. Uh, I probably shouldn't bring that up in this meeting, Miss. Miss. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> so any more unfinished business? The uh, next item, unfinished business. Anybody? Mr. Simms. None. Nope. Okay. Any updates? Updates. Any updates that we should know about? Do you want me to go? I, Mr. I just didn't know if Mr. Reyes was going to go through the commission matters. I was kind of going to, so uh, we talked about not doing commissioner matters, so I was going to skip it and then do it at the end and just, uh, <laughs> just as a fun thing, Mr. Stokes. <laughs> Anyhow, yes, as the, as the city had to provide us some updates, we'd be happy to hear them. Yes. Um, a few things. Um, we have, oh, I wish I had a calendar in front of me. Um, next month in July, <clears throat> you will not have a July 4th meeting, obviously, that will be canceled, but you have the opportunity to, to convene a special meeting if you, you're so willing on July 11th. We will be holding a meeting on July 18th. July 18th, we plan on two site plans being uh, reviewed at that meeting and also a, a future land use uh, map amendment in regard to a potential annexation that's coming into the city. So this is going to be a pretty heavy meeting. If, if you're all comfortable with it, then that's fine. We'll do it all on the 18th. If you would like to spread things out a little, we can have one of the site plans on the 11th and have a special meeting. I'm, I'm leaving that up to the commission. Doreen, am I, I correct? Think, I, I think we should uh, open the discussion here on that, guys. I'd, I'd like to see it split because that's going to be a pretty heavy load and it's going to be a lot to take in and I, we don't want to rush through it. Anybody else? Yes, I, I agree with you. That sounds like a good plan. Would the city be able to accommodate that for us? Absolutely. So on the 11th of July, we'll have a meeting instead of the 4th, and we'll have one of the site plans for you all to right, review. Right, that way we can right. split it up. Correct. And then on the 18th, we'll have another site plan for you to review. You're going to get busier. <laughs> um, and then a, a potential uh, future land use map change um, for uh, an annexation that may be coming into the city. It will be presented in front of the council on the 26th. The other item that I would really like to make sure that you are aware of is that we are a CDBG eligible city, meaning that um, the HUD dollars that are out there um, uh, come to the city of Sebastian. We, we don't have to uh, apply for them. <laughs> we are eligible to get HUD dollars. We have not in the last several years because we didn't have an updated five-year consolidated plan. We have hired a consultant who's going to take us through the process. We are having, I believe you all received invitations to the 26th. We are having a workshop. We invited all of the planning and zoning board, am I correct? No. Um, is that, is yeah, that the one to... Uh, no, I, I, I those went out in the mail. I got a letter. Of it. I got the letter. Yeah, it was it was a more of a, it was like That's a public that, okay, yeah, You're right. Something to do about the hard. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Sure, 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 about the so yes. we're we're asking you know our citizens and our stakeholders to come to this meeting and to review yeah, just what are letter, some yeah. of some of the eligible items that can that these dollars can go towards. Um, so I'm 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 bringing that to your attention. If you haven't received the invitation, please let us know. But but. Um, um, that is going to be at 5 o'clock on June 26th here in the chamber. And it's, it's, it's a special meeting. It's a special workshop. workshop. Um, we look forward to your input. Um, the other item I wanted to bring to your attention is August 15th. We will be having a uh, planning and zoning commission meeting because that's when you get the opportunity to review the CIP uh, plan for the budget. 
you repeat that? The um, capital, improvement. capital improvement plan. My goodness, I just, <laughs> it went right out of me. Um, the capital improvement plan that's part of our budget, our an annual budget, it is your opportunity to review it on August 15th. So I'm just putting these dates in Will front of Will the city have the accountant do a presentation for it? Yes. yes. Okay. I think that's all I have. I just had a little notice. You've got uh, next to your uh, chair two, there was the Muni Code supplement. Um, you haven't had one of those. This supplement covers the change to the code for the vacation rentals, which we had done last year. Um, the walls and fences, where we change the walls, uh, some of that fence code, and also where we change the personal service definition to allow the tattoo shops. So those were all the changes in the land development code um, that that supplement covers. And that's just, if you read that first page, it'll tell you which pages to change out, but it'll update your land development code so you'll be up to date with, you'll have a current land development code book. Okay, thank you. City Attorney Manners. I'm sorry, nothing from the, the oh. meeting on August 15th. I'm sorry to interrupt. What was that, the uh, six o'clock? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, it'll be a at regular. your regularly scheduled planning and zoning okay. commission meeting. Okay, thank you. And nothing from me, sir. Okay, I'd like to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Okay.